we've got online the irrepressible Casey Costello. Good afternoon, Casey. Irrepressible. Good afternoon, Rodney. Yes, you're always up and always positive and always <laughs> cheerful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I try to be. There's now, a solution out there. Now, to explain why Casey is with us, and she's with Hobson's Choice, which Please. is saying. Uh, Hobson's choice, Hobson's pledge, and we're going to get to that. So she's uh, explaining that there should be one law for all and one standard of citizenship, which is a very, very important principle for us in New Zealand. Casey Costello is, along with Don Brash, uh, the leading spokesperson for this group. I love them to bits what they're doing, and uh, Casey Costello is Maori. Um, so you can't attack her for being an old white Pākehā dinosaur. She's a young, vibrant Māori woman. So she ticks all those boxes. Therefore, I think the media uh, would rather run off to Don Brash and have an old white man that they could dismiss rather than go to a young, vibrant Māori woman. But Casey, you were a policeman once. Yeah, and I'm very grateful for the young. That was very nice of you. <laughs> you are young. I think I've given up my young status. <laughs> no, and you were a policeman, yes. though. Yes, yeah, I did most of my service in South Auckland. I left the police as a detective sergeant at sort of early in the, the century and um, went on to pursue other careers. But, yeah, I, I loved my police career. Was, you enjoyed being I a probably, police officer? Yeah, and it was probably a big reason why I, I started to... to question what was going on around this agenda of um, separate um, treatment before the law because I just I felt that we were missing the whole point of what the problems were that were facing New Zealand. Explain that to me. So when I, I suppose it's, it started to um, uh, started to get awakened sort of you know as your kids get older and you start to realize what country they're going to inherit and there was a lot of dialogue about Māori, um, you know, uh, oppression, racism, um, you know, this victim narrative that was being pushed. And it wasn't what I knew to be Māori. It wasn't how I was raised. It wasn't what I believed. And, and we were taught to have incredible pr pr pride and um, um, appreciation for who we are and that we could achieve anything. And there was this narrative that said somehow being Māori um, predisposed us to failure and and therefore this predisposition for failure had to be fixed by separating Māori from everyone else and creating a separate um, and I just felt that that was failing us you know if you tell a kid at school we expect less of you because you happen to have Māori ancestry um, how, how are you supposed to succeed and then we had successive Māori leaders telling us that, you know, we were somehow disadvantaged or we couldn't, there was no aspirational leadership and, and so therefore we started creating policy supporting that narrative. Um, Isn't it a shocking thing because behind the, the as you say, an, an implicit with this uh, two rules is that Maori can't make it on their own either because of their their own something or other, or because of other people, or because the system is against them. Mm. And so you're teaching young people, unless there's a special program, they can't make it. Yeah, and we've gone one step worse. We're not only saying, Māori, we expect less of us, we expect you to, to not succeed because the world's against you. We're also telling those that aren't Māori that you're to blame. I mean, how, how can kids in school are being told, you know, you're manahiri and you're tangas whenua. You know, this, this is, you, you're, you're a guest in this country and you're, so somehow we, we choose, um, we have to side with our ethnicity or our citizenship. And, and how do you create... Um, a, a positive future when that's what you're telling kids, uh, you know, in primary school. Well, you can't, can you? No. 
you, you can't be a police officer because, well, the whole police system and the justice system is, according to our leadership, institutionally racist. Yeah, that, that was the one that sort of that narrative that really, you know, when, when, you know, when you join the police, you swear an oath that you will, you know, without fear or favour, you know, similar language. Um, and now we're heading down the path where we have a commissioner saying that the police are institutionally racist. Now, I know what it's like out there policing now. It's way worse than when I left. Um, you don't, you're not out patrolling, looking for things. You're being called for things. You're being called into people's homes. You're being called into um, situations that you, you're not out there looking. So there's no possibility of you out there chasing down somebody because of their ethnicity. You're responding. And most of, most of our work, you know, frontline policing, was attending jobs to intervene to keep the peace and stop people killing each other. Yes. And and you, you're not you're not you know taking the call like oh we'll uh, we'll only take the calls from Maori because they're the only ones we're going to. That that's not how it works. To so to have the at a commissioner level saying that you know, this is institutional racism, it's it's overly simplistic and and you know they they quote statistics about the number of Maori in prison. Um, they're quoting statistics that represent less than, you know, it's less than, it's like 0.04% of the Māori population are in prison. But we're writing social policy as if half of Māori are in prison. Um, I, you know, um, I, got, I got directed to watch a old doc, TV documentary um, and um, it was hosted by a young weary gardener, which tells you mm -hmm. what its age was. And it was on that Archives TV New Zealand or New Zealand Archives. And it was about uh, Narumu, I hope I pronounced his name right, the VC winner who got the VC posthumously um, yep. in North Africa. And I watched the show and it was amazing to me because obviously they were talking to his uh, weary gardener was talking to his former uh, comrades and his sisters and his friends and they were Maori but they were so proud they were so good they were so admirable, every one of them. They were terrific people. And that is uh, my memory of um, Maori when I was growing up. Huge respect. Yeah. Hugely well-spoken. Huge pride uh, in themselves. Great people. Yeah, Is that and that's what you remember. I think, yeah, yeah, and that's that's how I was raised. This this concept of, um, you know, and and, and and you see it now. You know, you you were talking before about our politicians disconnected. We have politicians who are standing in the house, Maori politician after Maori politician after Maori politician, telling us whilst they're standing in the House of Representatives, telling us that you know that our our democracy has failed Māori. That they're actually standing in the house representing, you know, the New Zealand. I hadn't seen till you pointed out the absurdity of that. Yeah. So so instead of saying, you know, look, I've achieved it, which is what so many of these can do, they publicly stand in front of the media and in front of the public and say Poor Māori, we're just, you know, so oppressed. But in private, are highly successful, have achieved great things, and yet they're still pushing the narrative that somehow democracy has failed. Now, I think when we get to the point where a, a, a transsexual former prostitute Māori can become a mayor of Carterton, we can sort of put to end to the debate that, you know, democracy can't succeed for Māori, because that's just a nonsense. Yes, uh, it's, and it's now being 
it's just become an irrelevant debate. So, so rather than having uh, um, real solutions, aspirational leadership, we push a victim narrative to divide our nation and instead of focusing on what unites us and strengthens us as a nation, we're being distracted by, you know, at, at the moment we're just, being, we're just pushing a narrative that is allowing this government to say, look what we achieved without achieving anything. The, uh, you know, it's we, a great the, point because Georgina Byer uh, was the mayor of Carterton She stood in a conservative rural seat that would often be national. She stood against uh, Paul Henry, who was a highly regarded and well-known broadcaster, and she won the seat. So here was a a Maori transsexual, as you say, the first transsexual. um, I believe I'm right in saying her father was um, in the Maori battalion, a commander. Um, yeah, I think that's right, yeah. And um, I had a lot of time for Georgina um, because she actually carried herself with mana and respect. Yep, um, exactly. And, 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 you know, she got elected to a conservative uh, seat. And as you say, we now have Māori standing up in our parliament. I hadn't thought of this saying, oh, look, that democracy is a Pākehā thing that's colonial and British and empire and it doesn't work for us and that's Willie Jackson saying that in Parliament yeah. who's been feeding on the trough for yonks um, and so we're going to gift our mates not Maori our mates who are in the tribal hierarchy um, power over the plebs Maori and non Maori. Yeah. And and you get worse than that because now it's not only about Maori being a, a cultural position, it's now a political construct. Because if you don't agree with Willie Jackson You're not a if Maori. you happen to <laughs> Yeah. Not not only aren't you a Maori, you're a useless Maori. And he can say that in the press gallery. you know, he can say that to the press gallery at Parliament. He can say that another member of Parliament, leader of a party who, who is Māori ancestry himself, he can call him useless, a useless Māori, and the media say nothing. Nothing. There is not an outcry. There should have been screaming indignation. If you don't agree with Willie Jackson, you are not only not good enough, you're useless. You're a useless Māori. How offensive. And no one says a word. But isn't this part, and, and, isn't this part of this leftist Māori story that it's patronising? Because it's patronising yeah. in the sense that you can't make it without me giving you some help, i.e. Um, spending money and having power over you. And it's patronising in it that you can't think for yourself. I will tell yeah. you how to think. And if you think differently to me and you're Maori, you're a useless Maori. And if you're not a Maori, you're a racist. Yeah. Because Willie, and, and Willie is so stupid... He's um, incapable of thinking and debating. He's just like a bully boy, a thug, a thug, a verbal thugger. And I know yeah. really well. And and um, but he's incapable of having a conversation like you and I are having. Because um, if you disagree with him, he will just talk over the top of you and call you a racist or a useless Maori. He'll insult you. Yeah, and that's that's. And it denigrates into name calling and pointlessness, where you cannot have a conversation. You, you said earlier that you know about this, um, you know, that the media won't come after me; they go after Don. When, when we launched Hobson's Pledge in 2016, we sent out a press release with only my name and phone number on it. I never got a single phone call from any media. They actually took camera co- crews to track down every trustee that was, you know, the forming trust of Hobson's Pledge. Every male parkia on our trust got a camera crew sent to them to front them up. And yet I was the only name and they didn't interview me once. Not one question was put to me. And that was how you, you cannot, you can't fight the narrative. So you've got to, you know, you've, you've got to, you know, make it a, a target. 
they're not journalists, are they? They're not journalists. They're political. No. They're political hit. They're political hit yeah. people. You see it in cartoon after cartoon, just banging on yeah. the poor national and, party. And I, so my my father was a journalist. Like, and I was laughing when you were talking about the Auckland Star with Carl Frame. Yeah, you know, that's where my dad. No, he started off, you know, in Nash Matter, but he was in the Herald, and then he went to the Auckland Star, and he spent most of his career at the Auckland Star. And you know those rooms with the smoke haze over the top <laughs> and all this sort of thing. But but journalism to dad, you know, and he was he would always say he was still writing, you know, two days before he passed away, he he had his last article published and then he passed away just after he made sure that they printed it right. Um and he he used to talk about the fact that, you know, you, you, you don't opinion isn't reporting. You have to provide a balance on both sides of the story. And if he was a young cadet produced a story that didn't have both sides he would literally get hit in the head with a rolled up newspaper yes. and told to go and get the story. Yes. You know, there, there was no opportunity to, oh, look, I'll just, you know, talk to this guy um, and or I'll say that he wasn't available for comment and that becomes a story. And, and, and we just lost that, that critical thinking. And, of thinking. course, what your dad did was go away and learn to write properly, whereas nowadays <laughs> they'd go away and have a wee cry. Yeah. Tell me about <laughs> yeah. what was... What was Hobson's, Governor Hobson's pledge? So there's some, you know, some discussion over it, but basically at the signing of the treaty, he greeted each of the chiefs and said, hei tato, which is, you know, we are one people. So it was this concept. And, and even if you dispute that, Sir Nata gave an amazing speech in 1940 at the centenary celebration, which reiterated the fact that we had become one people. You know, we were, um, and and that was our strength. That was our strength to be able to move forward as 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 one people, um, and and one law. And he, one of his quotes was, "The main purpose of the government of Queen Victoria was for all New Zealand, including the European and the Maori inhabitants, all men in the land, to come under the authority of a specific government." Did no one tell Aparana Nata that he was? up against a racist institution and he couldn't be a revered uh, public figure, member of parliament, loved and beloved uh, across all of New Zealand. Did, did he not get that memo? No, he obviously Jackson? didn't get the memo because I, I, there's a great um, discussion where Sir Peter Buck was interviewed because they were great friends and um, and they he talked about their education and stuff and he actually says, you know, he wasn't particularly smart. He just knew how to work hard. Yes. Now, if that's what we could tell, if that's what we could tell every young person, that, that, you know, not that you can do anything you want to do, but you can work at it and achieve. Yeah. And the worst, the worst, most devaluing part of this agenda that somehow Māori creates as victimhood is this idea that even if you do succeed as a Māori, if you become the best doctor, the best lawyer, whatever it might be, there's always at the back of your mind, did I get this on my merit? Yes. So, you know, when, when I got promoted in the police, when I became a detective or a sergeant or a detective sergeant, always at the back of my mind was this, did I get it because I was really good at my job? Or did I get it because I was a quota? And so there's always this nagging, Thing, you know, and, and I think that's what you rob people of. You rob people of their achievement if you start, you know, having this, this it's drive. Terrible. To it's absolutely terrible. It is, it is uh, patronising people. You look at people differently because you think, are you a real doctor or did you just, they have to, they have to get a Maori on uh, 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 through that day. Um, are you? A, yeah. Did you get elected on the merit? Did you get that job on the merit, or are you the token woman? It is just ghastly. And, um, and I, I, I sit, I sit there and the, like I've, I've done a few, you know, interviews, Māori TV or whatever show it might be, and you sit in the green room, and and these are really smart, intelligent, capable people who are saying, you know, that you know, I've just moved into the grammar zone so my kids could go to Auckland grammar schools and I've just bought this property and I'm this. And then they sit in front of the camera and they tell, oh, you just don't know how hard it is for Māori. Why aren't they telling the success story? Why aren't they saying, look, guys, I've done it, you can do it? Why, why is our first priority to tell the victim narrative? 
why not tell a success story? Why not be aspirational? You know, I, I don't. So, I don't understand it. I, I honestly don't understand it. I mean, they're very hypocritical. They're very middle class. Uh, they're very self satisfied, and but they feel it's that old story. You know, what about this poor child in Africa? Yeah, and I'll flick them a couple and, of bucks, and 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 they yeah, sort of relieve and, their conscience. And that's why I think that this this idea of co-governance is so dangerous because you are basically entrenching in our system the this idea that we have two two forms of governance, but that we lose accountability. We lose the ability. When you start appointing people based upon race, you lose the ability to A, hold them to account and B, kick them out. And that's going that, to create. That's, that's that is going to create. That is going to create resentment, both sides. It's going yep. to create entitlement. It'll be impossible to unwind, and I think it'll lead to uh, violence. Well, and and the the, the ultimate this, this lack of accountability, because the, you know these these MPs that are uh, um, you know campaigning for this idea. They have the perfect storm. They can say, this is the solution. And if that isn't a solution, they blame colonisation for it failing. They yeah. blame systemic racism for failing. Oh, they can't so be So they wrong. don't have to be accountable for anything. They don't have to be blamed because they've created a, a victimhood. Uh, they've encouraged people to, you know, follow me because... I'm the, you know, I'm the light and the way. Like you, you I'll be the solution. Yeah. But if that solution doesn't come, if you still can't feed your family or heat your house or find a home to live in, the blame sits with colonisation. The blame sits with something that they don't have to take. These elected representatives don't have to take responsibility because they will always have the ability to offload their failings on I'm, something else. I'm speaking with the young and vibrant uh, and vivacious Casey Costello. She's with <laughs> Ho Hobson's Pledge. She's a wonderful woman and has become a good friend of mine. I love spending time with her. I always go away uplifted and enthused and enthusiastic <laughs> about New Zealand. Tell me, Casey, what is it that Hobson Pledge is trying to achieve for New Zealand? The, the, so when we formed, we wanted to um, make this a debate, have people talk about it and wake up to what it was meaning. And we were just, you know, this isn't an issue. What, what I think we've achieved is at least now, um, after six years, it's now a conversation. It's now a political issue. Well, you know, co-governments co co in three waters have kicked it along. Yeah. Something Yeah, shocking. and that's the thing. Is, so... So the, 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 our, our, I suppose our goal, you know, what we're trying to achieve, what we truly want is that we have a nation that we, um, we advocate for um, equality and unity and that we want to ensure that the, the na our nation as we move forward is one that all New Zealanders are equal before the law. Yes. Now, there, there may be things you have to do to achieve better outcomes, but the, 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 the sort of the, the deterioration of, of rights, you know, we, we have even ACC. So you look at um, the ACC will fund um, Rongo Māori. So they'll, they'll, they'll fund Māori treatments. Now, if you are someone who's in, in chronic pain and, and currently the ACC, you, you're restricted on what you can get. And we're funding race-based, unproven medicine treatments um, with, with taxpayer money. We're, we're funding this because for what? You know, there, there's amazing cancer treatments that people can't get treatment for. And yet we have the Māori Health Authority is going to fund traditional Māori medicine treatments. And we know there's proven scientific treatments <laughs> that, that, you know, there's, there's people have been unable to get access to or have to have, you know, mortgage their homes to get access to. And we're just allocating $100 million for, you know, 
witch doctor and I think you know and I grew up with all these remedies and this is I had all these sort of treatments when you're a kid I was a bad asthmatic and I had all of these things that you had to it's, be treated with that was going to make you well it's an interesting thing because I remember um, John Ansell telling me that and that we should run a campaign about the marification of everything and I resiled from it because I don't want to hit down on Maori. Um, I don't want to belittle um, people's cultural or ethnic origins in any way, shape or form. But the funny thing is, looking back, he was right. Because when you say the marification of everything, it's not actually a racial thing it's a political thing that's occurring, isn't it? There's a political program that, you know, Willie Jackson and Namaya Huta are running and all the academics and bureaucrats and, you know, sucky people that hang off them and the taxpayer dollar are running, which is to do that everywhere you look, isn't yeah. it? And it's not about... It's not about delivering better outcomes. It's no. not about delivering better outcomes. I could accept it. But, you know, we, we've stopped talking about Ihumatau. Now, Ihumatau would have had 40 brand new homes for Komata to, and to live in now, as well as developing the stone fields and creating the reserves and protecting all of the stuff. Drive out to Ihumatau now. Instead of having 40 new homes for, you know, Komata to live in, instead of having jobs and creation and development. We've got the same piece of land that was there. So so we're... Yeah, we're, this is interesting too, Casey, isn't it? Because you look at that and it's an easy conclusion to draw that Maori are useless because, look, they got that land and nothing's happened. But the problem is it's not Maori that's useless, it's government no. that's useless. Yeah. And government taking control of Maori lives... Um, and they had it sorted, that Stonefields development, didn't they? Yeah. Until and a few so protests. It's about, yeah, and, and so what we're doing is, is I won that one, regardless yeah. of whether there was any benefit to anybody. It's about a victory. It's about, you know, look what I've done here, and not about, and that's when, you know, you start having the discussion about, that's why we just see the same names, the same people representing, you know, they're the trustees, they're the spokespeople, they're on the working groups, they're making the six-figure salaries on all of these initiatives as consultants and representatives. None of it's trickling down. None of it's getting to the, those no. who are truly in need. It's just the and same self-serving group all the time, and over of and over again. of course, part and parcel of this has been the destruction of the family, uh, the destruction yep. of educational opportunities, and all those things that made Sir Aparana Nata and his cohort great. And and the education one is the classic. Yes. You know, while while we're busy distracted with you know discussing whether we'll have Te Reo Māori compulsory in school, whether we'll have you know the the compulsory history curriculum. We've got nearly 50% of Māori and Pacifica who do not routinely attend school. And we're worried about whether... I mean, that's like deciding what colour curtains we're going to put on the house when we haven't even put the foundations in. Now, like, we're just distracted with nonsense. It's ridiculous. We're going to go, everyone, to an hour of music uh, from another studio. <laughs> and I'll be back tomorrow, uh, 12 till 3. I've got a great show that's coming together. Now... Everyone's loving hearing you, Casey, as I do. Um, how do they help you, follow you, learn about Hobson Pledge? Where can people go? Um, so hobsonpledge.nz is our website. Um, you can, Hobson Pledge, um, all one word, dot .nz? Yeah, hobsonspledge.nz, yep. And, and that's our website, and you can um, connect there and you'll get our updates and emails. Well, um, I love it. We have I've, a few issues. I've signed up. And I get regular emails. Thank you very much. You keep me abreast of um, you keep me abreast of what's happening and what to be alarmed about. You keep me positive because there are people actually doing something and standing up for New Zealand. I love it that it's you. I kick you a few dollars down again 
um, to help in your Thank campaigns. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I just wish uh, more poor power to your arm. And what's going to happen is the mainstream media are going to continue to ignore you, to denigrate you, um, to belittle you. But here at the platform, there's always a place for the great and wonderful Casey Costello. And one law for all. Thank you very much, Rodney. Have a great day. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for being a truly Thanks. great New Zealander and following in a great tradition of so many great New Zealanders. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, Rodney. Bye. Don't we have in this great country of ours so many wonderful, great people um, so able to achieve, you know, a very successful police officer, police detective, detective sergeant, I don't know where, how, where all she went. She is an amazing woman and you meet her and you're meeting a dynamo, you know, you're meeting an intelligent woman. And because she's standing for the principle of one law blind to who your great, 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 great granddad was, blind to your colour of your skin, against dividing New Zealander by race, this wonderful lady, Casey Costello, is being belittled and um, abused, but it won't stop her because she's principled and she's right, and I ask you to hop along to Hobson Pledge and to support you.